and gentlemen, welcome back to our virtual investor forum. I'm your host, Dan Theok, Senior Vice President of Investment Banking. It's an exciting day here in studio. Mr. Finney Mears, CEO of Dollar Financials, joins us today for one of the most anticipated forums of the year. Kadeen will be giving us an investor update on the success of the company and, of course, the IPO, which opens today. Before we get started, we know our viewers can't wait to hear from the man himself, so we encourage you to post your questions in the chat and be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more insight into your favorite companies on the JSE. Now let's talk Dollar Financial Services. Dollar Financial Services was incorporated in October 14, 2009. The company is a subsidiary of First Rock Private Equity Limited, which currently owns 75%. Dollar's initial objective was to provide a full suite of financial services to the public. The company was organized into three divisions, namely loan and financing, remittance and bill payments, and lastly, the Cambio division. Dollar Financial Services foresees the significant potential for growth of its loan portfolio in the Caribbean region. The company's listing on the JSE will, make instrument, will be instrumental in supporting its growth objectives by providing capital for expansion. And we do expect to see lots of growth from the company. So a quick reminder that if you're looking for sound advice from experts who can assist you in expanding your portfolio or embark on your very first investment journey, Mayberry Investment should be your first and only choice. Follow us on social media or visit our website at mayberryinv.com to learn more. Now let's introduce our guest for today, Mr. Kadeem Maris. He's CEO of Dollar Financial Services Limited, and he's responsible for the execution of their business strategy operating guidelines and internal controls. Mr. Maris, which I love saying that name, <laughs> has a proven track record of performance in the areas of entrepreneurship, change management, organizational restructuring, credit risk management, human resources. In fact, he does everything. <laughs> he also serves as a director for Dollar Financials Guyana, a subsidiary of Dollar Financials Jamaica. Lastly, Mr. Maris is chairman of the Equity Capital Management an associate stake shareholder of Dollar Financial Jamaica. I'd like to welcome to the program, Mr. Kadeem Harris. Kadeem, it's great to have you on the program. How are you feeling this morning, bro? I mean, today is the opening. Today is a, a great day. I'm feeling awesome. Um, a lot of anticipation, and I'd say that it's a, it's a glorious occasion. Excellent. This is one of the most anticipated IPOs of the year, no doubt. And I really look forward to asking you some questions about it, taking a brief look at the prospectus. And, and having a good time in general. Now, folks out there, don't forget to send in your questions uh, to social media, and we'll try our best to answer uh, if we can. Uh, apologies to our chairman, Christopher Berry, and CEO, Gary Parrott, who couldn't make it today, but they did send in some questions, which I'll incorporate into our questionnaire. First up, first question from me. Dollar has seen a marked improvement in recent years. The company's brand is everywhere. What's been the main driver for this today? I mean, the main driver for the growth at Dollar Financial is one word, capital. Um, in a business of lending, where cash is our inventory, it's very important to have um, cash so that you can unlend. Um, I can still remember years ago when we started, and we would have repeat customers come into a location, and we have to tell them they have to come back two days later because we didn't have the cash flow mm -hmm. to unlend. And these were good loans. Yeah. So when we were in the position to raise capital and to unlearn, that that's really where we saw the spurring growth. Excellent. And through this IPO, you guys are looking to raise $250 million into the company, $250 Correct. to the selling shareholder. I mean, obviously, that money is going to be used to further blow up your loan book. For sure. For Good sure. Deal. And looking at the results, I saw where to March, I mean, you've grown your loan book to approximately 900 plus million. So mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say you're going to tip a billion dollars within a couple of months. I, I Safely, safely. Good deal. What's next? Two billion dollars? Um, we have plans. Yeah. Um, you know, the growth is we don't cap our growth. You know, we're very optimistic. You know, um, once we unlend this capital that we have, I mean, 250 million will go fast. Um, of course, we'll have to, you know, go back to the drawing boards and figure out how can we raise some more capital yep. with a debt or equity to yep. continue to grow yep. in order to hit that $2 billion mark. Well, remember, maybe it's here to help you with some financial advice. What I can tell you off the top of my head 
is that after you raise this $250 million, your debt to capital ratio will be you know, relatively low, well below 50%. You could easily take on additional $200 million of debt, and you would still be below 50%. Right. And if you continue with the kind of run rate you're going to, I think you'll have $500 million of additional capital. So I see you, at, this is Dan Theok speaking as an analyst, at a $2 billion loan book within two years, or I'll be disappointed. Bro. <laughs> we'll, hit, we'll hit the numbers. What, what do you think the stock price will be? Well, that, that, listen. <laughs> now, I am an investment advisor. I'm licensed, so listen to me carefully, folks. Now, when you look at the prospectus, I don't know, guys, can we bring up one of those pages? He has trailing earnings of $217 million before tax. So when you look at what their profit was for the first quarter and you work out the 12-month trailing, that's $217 million uh, with the $900 million loan book. So I'm going to predict that they're going to raise $250, raise another $200 million of debt, and blow up that debt book very quickly to about $1.5 billion. And I would be surprised if a year from now, his trailing earnings isn't closer to $360 million. This is Dan Theok as the analyst speaking now. I don't need to, I don't need to check with Kadeen. I'm telling you what's going to happen, folks. At $360 million, you know, his EPS is going to be in the space of about 15, 16 cents, 20 times PEO, you get your stock price, $3.20. Easy. I see this easy as a $3. $3.20 stock price, so I think it's a giveaway at a dollar, Kadeen. That's just my view. Oh, well, that would be great for the company yeah. and our shareholders. It's going to happen. It's going to happen, folks. Okay, moving on to some other questions. Tell us about Guyana. Who are your competitors there, and, and, and why did you go to Guyana? What's happening in Guyana? I mean, um, we've spent a lot of time in different Caribbean countries. Um, one of the greatest things is that when you're trying to grow your business, you have to spend time in the country that, you're, that, that, you, that you want to operate in. We spent a lot of time in Haiti. We spent a lot of time in Guyana. We've been to other Caribbean countries. The, we have to find locations or countries that you know, fit our risk, risk profile. We have to find countries that um, um, fit our culture. Guyana was one such country. We spent a lot of time there. Um, in terms of the, the landscape in Guyana, I'd say that we are the, we're the first to market, um, basically. There are, a lot of, there, there are quite a few NGOs, non-governmental organizations, mm -hmm. but those are more non-for-profit. And um, they are not um, microfinance companies, per se. So, you know, being the first movers in Guyana, it really gives us an edge. There are a lot of industries that are opening that are supported by the, the oil and gas industry that we're really taking advantage of, a lot of invoice financing, a lot of structured and secured loans. So, you know, we've managed to grow the loan book since we opened it in September um, to 100 million Guyanese dollars. And we've seen consistent growth. We've, we've continued to be patient um, in, in terms of our lending. So. You know, Guyana is somewhere that we see that will be competing strongly with um, Jamaica. So, as you said, if the if the loan book is at two billion dollars in Jamaica, I'm sure Guyana will be right behind it. Yeah, I think it's a great choice. You know, we've been over to Guyana a couple of times through our work with Supreme Ventures. We have a business over there, and I, I've gotten over there quite a bit, and I'm really impressed with what's happening in Guyana. Mm -hmm. And that economy is just going to be blowing up over the next two to five years because of the gas and oil industry. So I think it's a good move. I, I like the culture there as well, too. When you're in Georgetown, it kind of yeah. reminds me of Kingston 20 or 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And the development that's going to be coming there is just going to be tremendous. So I think it's a, it's a great move. Uh, I agree with you, too, that the financial sector there is really underserved. So I'm really looking for big things there. Again, looking at your numbers, I could see where you're just getting to a break-even yeah. point in Guyana. Guyana. Correct. So again, I think there's great potential coming out of that business there. Tell me, um, how automated is your company's loan processing uh, procedure? So, I mean, you know, it, at the time that we are right now, um, just like many other companies, you're able to go on our website, you're able to apply for a loan, you're able to, you know, op upload your KYC, your ID, your TRN, you're able to upload your pay slips. That information goes straight to our underwriting department who will they process the loan, contact the customer, you know, decide if this is an approval or not. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty automated, but I'll still say that um, when it comes to Dollar Financial, one of our strengths is our personality and what we bring to the business. Customers still like the fact that they can come in 
not only apply for a loan, but sit down and find out if a loan might be the best solution mm -hmm. at the time. So in practicing prudent lending, you know, you can come into Dollar Financial thinking you might need a loan and, and we'll convince you that probably a loan is not the solution and we'll help you work through your, your, your business problems. So that's kind of one of the strengths in terms of the, the company's personality. I like it. And I like the fact that you guys have grown your loan book really aggressively and quickly and then at the same time managed to control your expected credit losses Correct. and your loan delinquency rates. So I, I, I have to assume you have a good credit committee and... You know, tell us a little bit about that process because I'm sure it's not all about you. You've got to have a good team behind yeah. you helping to do the credit assessments and stuff Correct. like that. Correct. So, so what we've done and what we've learned over the years, especially with COVID, you know, we had to become more efficient. So, you know, supporting me, I have my C CFO, I have my COO, and uh, these are the guys that ensure that the operations are, are, are well run while I focus on strategy, you know, looking at, you know, possible regions, um, possible locations in a region that we might want to expand to. We've centralized our underwriting. So even in Guyana, you know, it just serves as an outlet and then all the loan comes to underwriting. The assessments are done. You know, we have our collections department, we have our marketing department, HR and all of that is centralized. Mm -hmm. So cost our cost on that side are pretty much frozen. Um, cost in terms of human resources goes more towards our sales team mm -hmm. than anything else and just improving our collections department. Good deal. So as you grow that loan book towards a to bill, we're going to see that flowing to the bottom line. Correct. You, you got the infrastructure in place. Correct. Already. We have the infrastructure in place. We've been putting in the work. Good. I hear the calls coming in, folks. We can't take them right now, mm -hmm. but we're going to focus on some more questions. How many locations do you currently have, and, and, and what's your thoughts just for the next, you know, 12 months? What's, you know, what's, what's going to drive growing that loan book and getting to $2 billion? What's actually going to be required, you think, to get there? I, I mean, in terms of current locations, we have eight locations okay. in Jamaica. Um, two are in Mobe, so we're in Kingston, right back to, to, to Westmoreland. Um, so we're in Sav, we're in Lucy, we're in Junction, St. Elizabeth, you know, we're in Mandeville, we're in Discover Bay. Um, you know, we've been, been getting a lot of demand for loans in, in, in highly populated areas like, you know, Portmore mm -hmm. and even in Kingston. So you see us opening probably another branch in Kingston, Portmore, and we're looking at other, you know, parishes that, that you know, a branch presence can really grow mm -hmm. the business. Um, so that's what we're looking at, you know, regionally, you know, where, as, as I said, one of our strengths is we're the type of company that will we'll spend time in our country to decide if, you know, based on the, the, the regulatory structure in our country and the people, if it's a best fit for our culture. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Good deal. Sounds good. Next question. Skip that one, guys. How do you plan to navigate the microfinance space with rising interest rates uh, incurring both locally and overseas? Well, you know, um, contrary to popular belief, rising interest rates, you know, actually is good for our business in the sense that, you know, what will happen is that commercial banks will raise, raise their interest rates. We don't have to raise our interest rates because we have already priced in our interest rate, the risk of um, interest rates being risen as, as, as well as other risk. So when a bank, for example, hypothetically, uh, you know, increases their interest rate from 10 to 15 percent, if we were at 20, 25 percent, we would remain the same. Right. However, a customer going to a bank with an increased interest rate, you know, um, you know, tightened um, lending policies, you know, more red tape, they might decide that it's better to go to dollar financial, you know, at a little higher rate than actually going to a commercial bank with a new interest rate. That makes sense to me. So what we're saying basically again is, although we're seeing rising interest rates, generally that's more in the formal sector, so to Correct. speak. You're actually reducing your cost of borrowing and your sources of funding through this IPO as an example. So you've secured your sources of funding, your cost of funding is perhaps going down. down. And your rates could stay the same, but the gap between your rates and the formal sector are closing. And again, I think a lot of people come to you more about your own flexibility and how Correct. you work with them. So it's not it's so the much ease the of doing interest business. rate, but the ease right. of doing business. So uh, thanks for that question, folks. But rising interest rates in the general market, I think, actually favor you Correct. in the space that you're playing. What's the average repayment period for your you know, loan business? Tell us a little bit about the, the loan book and you know what it looks like, I mean, average period. And yeah, I mean, the average period is, is probably like six to nine months. Okay. 
um, as well as the average size for a loan um, typically is about 150,000 Jamaican to 200,000. Got it. That's not to say that you don't do much No, much, we, much we, we, we do much larger loans. As you can see in the prospectus, our loan book has been very diversified. Uh, majority of our loan book is secured. Right. And most secured loans, you know, have a higher um, loan value. So, um, you know, those loans wouldn't fall apart of the average. Right. And we're just talking about the, the smaller micro loans. Got it, got it, got it. But tell us about some of the sectors that you're, you're lending to now, because you're obviously finding a bit of a niche and finding sectors that you need to serve. I believe when I read the prospectus, I, college was one of them. Tell yeah. us a little bit about the types of persons you're dealing with who um, might want to come in and knock you up for a loan. Well, the... the what happens now with the sector is that a lot of our a lot of our competitors focus on consumer um, consumer products. consumer products. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've more diversified our loan book. We focus on more you know business to business loans. So when you look at our ratio in terms of you know who we lend to, we're probably two to one, two to you know SMEs, micro, small, and one to consumer versus you know our competitors, which is more like seven to one, seven to consumer, consumption. Are correct. So we don't focus on consumption. Um, we focus on companies that, you know, want bridge financing to grow. So our capital is for growing the economy, not for consumption mainly. I like so, it. So in terms of diversification, we've diversified in so many industries. COVID has taught us so much. Um, so if there's supposed to be a recession or another, you know, um, pandemic, will be so diversified that we'll be able to, you know, um, whatever shock that might come, we could we could withstand it. So industries, you know, we're in tourism. We've, we have exposure in tourism, you know, transportation, construction, real estate, um, you name it. W any business that a small entrepreneur, medium-sized entrepreneur might be thinking of going into, will be able to allocate capital to online. I like that. And, and, and with this successful IPO, you'll have more capital <laughs> to online. Tell me about the uh, staff complement. What's the approximate size of your staff complement? So we're at about 30 um, staff okay. in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And then in Guyana, we're at about six. Okay. So Lean and mean. I like it. Correct. Next question. Are there any plans to acquire other players within the microfinance space? I know with the regulations that, that's coming, not everybody is going to be able to keep up with it. There's Guys with $50 million, $100 million loan book, your, book, your book's already at $900 million. We'll be at $1.3 billion in no time, hopefully $2 billion in, in 12 months. So are you considering acquiring other players in well, this space? Well, as you said, in terms of you know the microcredit act and what's about to happen, you find that a, a lot of consolidation will happen. A lot of companies will decide to exit mm -hmm. or to sell. Mm -hmm. um, so we just want to be in a position, which the IPO will help us to be right. in a position where we have capital. So if an opportunity should come to us, you know, we can do an acquisition or we have enough, you know, equity to leverage some debt to do an acquisition. So um, it's all about being prepared for the opportunity if acquisitions should arrive, arise. But we definitely think that a lot of put, a, a lot of opportunities will come up for acquisitions over the next three months. Sounds good. What do we have next, guys? Before we move on to questions coming in from our live chat, we have some questions from our chairman, Mr. Mr. Berry, and our CEO, Mr. Parrott. First one from Gary. Gary asks, how did the dollar team grow the loan portfolio so quickly? So we're talking about going from 200 million to 900 million in like 12 months, right? Correct. Well, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a very valid question because when you look at the growth, it, that will that will trigger you to you know wonder how did we how did we why didn't we do that a long time ago and how did that spur of growth right, happen right. now what happens is that if we're not able to raise capital we're not able to unlend got it so over the time you know we've tried to tap the capital markets we did our first private placement years ago we were man we managed to raise you know 30 million dollars mm -hmm. once we unlend that 30 million dollars we're at a point where it's hard for us to grow further, right? Right. So we're stagnant for probably a year or two years. You know, growing the business. You know, taking on our new equity partners like First Rock. Mm -hmm. What that allows us to do now with a new corporate governance and structure is to tap the cap market again. And when we, you know, do a private placement, you know, institutional investors, pension funds will now look at us in a different light. Yep. You know, so we were able to raise, for example, last year. 
we were able to raise $200, $200 million Jamaican in a bond. Um, and then we were able to raise an additional 1 million US. So what happens is that we have this built up demand, right? That, and we're, we're, we're able to unlend when we get that capital. So you'll definitely see the growth. And you'll see that as well after we raise this 250. Um, you know, when you analyze our cash flow, um, you'll realize that, you know, we might have low cash balances. The reason for this is that we keep unlending, right? right? So with this IPO as well, this $250 million, We'll, we'll just unlend that 250 over, say, three months and, and continue to grow the loan book. Sounds good. So so some folks think of you as the new kid on the block, but the point is you've been at this for a couple of years. You've yeah. really gotten a good understanding of the business, and now that the capital is coming in, you'll have no challenges in deploying it. Thanks for that question, Gary. Next question. His follow-up to that question is, This fast gro has this fast growth created more risk? No. And the reason behind that is COVID. Right. Um, you know, during COVID, if you look at our numbers um, that are in the prospectus, our delinquency, you know, spiked from single digit to about 12, 13 percent. Right. And, uh, you know, at that time, we had to, you know, go back to the drawing board and figure out how can we diversify the loan book, as I said, to withhold, withstand any shock that might come. Um, so with our massive growth what we've done is we've ensured that at least 60 percent of our portfolio are secured mm -hmm. and when it's secured that means real estate or motor vehicle um, of course we accept other collaterals because we, we can be very creative right but the loan book that you're looking at that that's defined as secured is motor vehicle and real estate so in terms of risk that minimizes our e-sales significantly got it and, I, and you can see that in the results so we saw the spike in the delinquency and we see that correcting fairly quickly i think the worst of the pandemic is behind us when this increased capital you should really be able to grow the business mr barry wants to know what potential do you see for the microfinance business in jamaica and how is it different from traditional banking potential for the seg for, the, for the sector um you know put it this way and we have, our population is almost 3 million people. Yep. Um, you know, we have the formal and informal economy. The informal economy is significantly yeah. greater <laughs> than the formal economy. Um, I've seen statistics that show that the underbanked or, or unbankable people are 70% mm -hmm. of the population. If we pull the statistics and it shows that, you know, we have 200, 250,000 people, you know, that are contributing to NHD and PAYE, we put them apart at the formal economy. Mm -hmm. But if they are 20% of the total market, that puts us a little over a million working people, people who are small entrepreneurs, um, people with nine to five, people who are hustling, right? Um, that, that additional seven, 800,000 people would be the market that we have potential to tap into. When we look at our competitors, they'll probably have 20,000 companies, which means that they have not even um, they're not even close to the surface mm -hmm. in terms of their potential mm -hmm. and, and they prob probably are ahead of us. So I'd say that in terms of the future of microfinance and the po potential, it's significantly on top. Got it, got it. And so, so, so how many customers do you have? So you say some of your competitors have as much as 20,000? Correct. Maybe. I mean, the market leader now probably has about 20,000 customers. And you guys um, have? We're, we're over, little over 5,000 customers. 5, Good. And you did mention that you're seeing repeat business Correct. From, from a lot of these customers. The, as well. the life cycle of a customer for us is um, probably three, three to five loans. Right, right. So a customer will come back three to five times okay, um, to, to tap some uh, you know, loans and, and to grow their business. Excellent. I like that. And then now let's look at a couple of questions from our live chat. You guys will have to help me see those questions on my iPad. While you set up my iPad so I can see those live questions. Um, I, I did want to go look back at the prospectus. So we, we saw the great improvement in the financial performance. Um, we saw the expected, cr um, uh, expected credit, credit losses loss. going mm -hmm. down substantially. I mean, you've been averaging about 4 or 5%, so you're obviously managing the, the credit risk there impressively. Um, we saw the loan book growing to 900 and plus million dollars by March. I think we can get to 1.3, 1.4 billion by the end of the year. Your financial year end, could you remind me? My financial year end is December. It's December, yeah. so you got about six months to, yes. to, to work this money. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to you know bigger and better things. Um, I personally would be surprised if the IPO doesn't close today. Please don't comment. That's just me speaking as an analyst. 
And um, folks, I, I think he's going to get to about $2 billion. I'm just <laughs> making a good guess here. Do not comment, Mr. Maris. I don't want to get you in trouble. I'll, I'll take all the heat as the analysis. I'm an analyst. OK. All right, well, I got some more questions for sure. Um, and we wrapped this up in about 10 minutes again, guys. If you have any more questions, please feel free to send them in. Just having a little bit of a technical challenge here now. Um, OK, there we do it. We do it old school. We take it on the phone. And I'll require my glasses to be able to read this. <laughs> Excuse my ugly glasses, guys. first one comes in from Mr. Chemical. With the impending recession and the slowdown in the Jamaican economy, how will you manage the risk of default from customers and how will that impact your business? Um, in terms of how you know, a possible recession will impact the business, um, a, a recession is twofold. You, know, you have decline and you also have an increase in, 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 in where anywhere there's a decline, there's an increase. Yep. So what that will bring is that a lot of customers might see opportunities, opportunities for acquisitions, opportunities for growth. Customer might come in and say, hey, look, my neighbor is selling this property. Um, how can you help me with a bridge financing? Mm -hmm. So we're looking forward to those you know, opportunities. Um, in terms of the, what was the other part of the question? How will you manage the risk of default? In terms of default, that's why, you know, as we said, COVID really taught us a lot. Our portfolio, as we said, we maintain probably a 60% secured um, loan book. So in terms of default, at least we know that in the event that um, we need to recover, then there is a high possibility of recovering our capital. I got that. And so you've been through a bit of a pandemic. You've seen the pullback. You, you, you got a good credit uh, risk team in place, and I think you've developed the muscle to deal with that. So I, I feel pretty confident. And as you said, the recession sometimes creates more, activ uh, more activity, activities, more opportunities. Next question comes in from Matthew Preston. Do you guys plan to pay a dividend this year? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, based on our balance sheet, you can see our retained earnings. Yep. You see our, our, our profitability for the first quarter. Yep. At the end of the day, you know, it's up to the board of directors to decide, you know, if a dividend is to be paid. But I, I'd say that it's highly likely. Good deal. And Matthew, listen, your best return in the first year is going to be the growth in the stock price. And what I want Mr. Mayors to do, I really like calling him Mr. Yeah. Mayors, is to focus on growing that loan book so that we can continue to drive value to folks. And in the prospectus, they made it clear that their dividend policy is to look at paying dividends of up to uh, 50%. But my advice as an analyst is to focus on growing that debt book for the first year because you're going to reward people handsomely with substantial growth in the share price. So I think that's where the value is going to come from. Another question from Mr. Chemical with two Cs. Another microfinance firm on the market is Access Financials. How do you compare to them, and what will you do to reduce the slowdown in growth um, and your return on capital like them? Um, I mean, you know, I've always said as an entrepreneur, you know, I mean, Supreme, Supreme Ventures is into the horse racing business, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, horses have blinders. Yeah. And in order to win a race, you have to keep your blinders on yes, and focus. Absolutely. So, you know, when a question is asked about my competitors, you know, I don't have much to say about that. Yeah. But if you ask me about my plans for the future, then I can definitely tell you, you know, where the group will come from. I appreciate that. And, and Mr. Chemical, listen, there are lots of other microfinance businesses out there. Uh, four others already listed on the, on the market as well. What I like about um, Dollar is their focus, and he's told you what his focus is on, and it's growing the economy. And you've seen them grow their loan book despite that competition that's out there, so nothing's changed. The only thing that's changed is this guy now has access to a lot more capital. So I agree with you. We don't worry about the others. <laughs> we focus on how we can grow the business. So I, I look forward to that. Well, Kadeem, listen, I don't need to drag this out. I want to let you get back to the business of looking at uh, how this IPO is going and letting us know when it's going to close. Folks, by Monday you'll hear. I'm going to predict it right here. It's closing today. That's just my prediction. I got no insider information here. I think Dollar <laughs> Financials is a great company. I'm going to be getting me some of those shares, whether at the IPO or on the open Post market. IPO. I'm, I'm definitely going to be buying, and I look forward to having you back here in another six months so we can look back at how you've deployed the capital and how you've continued to grow the business. 
and to prove to me that that $68 million profit for the quarter wasn't a fluke. Right. I don't think it was a fluke. I think you're going to do much better. And I think when you come back in a year's time, folks, and you guys are going to say, Dan Theok was spot on with that $360 million project, pr projected profitability, profit before tax. Another good thing about listing, of course, is you get the tax, tax, -free, the tax break. break and, yeah. and that, again, creates more space for you to have more capital, capital. to so, further so grow your business. So if you can make you know, two, three hundred million dollars profit in a 12 month period and be conservative with the dividends, mm -hmm. that's more money to pump back into, into the business, business to further grow it. So Kadeem, it's really a pleasure having you on well, our program today. It's great to be here at Mayberry, you know, um, to be on this platform. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, listen, this guy's a very inspirational guy. I'm one of your followers. I'm <laughs> a big fan. I, I think you're going to do great things. I like what you and the team are doing, yourself and Ryan and Chris and the entire team. Really like what you guys are doing. We look forward to having you back. Appreciate it. With that, I'd like to thank our viewers for your usual support. I'd also like to thank our special guest, Mr. Kadeem Mears, for joining us today. I really love that name. Yeah. All viewers are invited to join us weekly for even more discussions on the local and global markets. Be sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date with all things form related. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Mayberry Investments Limited. Keep safe, and remember, wise investors, slow and steady wins the race. Take care.